Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. The following seminar is brought to you by iExplore Club. I am honored to be introducing our seminar presenter today, Ryan Kern. This seminar is a part of his weekly biology series. So shout out to those who have been here with us before. And if this is your first time here, we hope that you'll enjoy the seminar. So without further ado, here's Ryan on cellular respiration. Hello, my name is Ryan Kern. I'm currently a 10th grader at Troy High School. Here's our, uh, this is the warrior, that's our mascot at Troy. And here I have a swimming pool. This time's a little different. And I really like swimming, also playing water polo. That's why I chose a swimming pool. And here's a piano. I also like to play piano. And this is, I'm not sure if many of you know, this is actually something called a stethoscope. And you see doctors with it a lot of times, but it represents me wanting to go into the medical field. And I'm also very interested in biology, which is why I chose this background here that has like bacteria. Okay, so today we're gonna to be talking about cellular respiration. It can sound like a very big word, you know, and like everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's a big scientific word, like, but don't be scared, it's okay. We're gonna explain it and like why it's important, right? So here's like an overview. Again, it looks super complicated. Don't worry. We're just, just remember, right? We're trying to model like how when we eat something, how it goes through our body, how we actually get energy, right? Because we eat something and then before we know it, we're, we feel like awake, we feel strong, we feel like we can do stuff, we can like play, you know? If you don't eat breakfast, you don't eat lunch, and you don't eat dinner, you're gonna be super tired, you feel like you have no energy, and there's a reason for that. That's because our body needs food, and we were talking about cells before. The cells also need food as well. So if you don't feed them, they're not gonna be working well, and when you go to school, you're not, you can't pay attention. That's why they actually say that like breakfast is the most important meal, right? Because in the very early morning, you need to get that sort of jump start of energy from your food to get your morning started. And usually most kids go to school in the morning. So that's why it's very important to eat and then have your brain be ready to learn. And you can see there's big, like uh, the main steps here is something called glycolysis. It just kind of breaks it down a little bit and then it can either go inside the mitochondria, remember? That's this little squiggly kind of thing that's inside the cell and it makes energy. And, or it could do something called fermentation, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But you just need to remember that a lot of times in biology, really, it's always just taking one molecule, taking something like sugar, right? Breaking it down into something that the cell can use, right? Like you have a huge pizza in front of you, like so big, like maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. You can't just put the whole thing in your mouth. You have to break it down a little bit, then eat it, right? And you, you save some for later, break it down and then use up what you need. It's just like that. You start off with like the sugar and then it's going to break it down and then the cell can use some parts of it. And then maybe it doesn't need like all of it or something like that. So that's really what we're trying to focus here. Okay. But a lot of times, like we just start with a definition, right? And then we get right into it. But I really wanted to hold your horses here, right? Before we actually get super deep into it and like obviously not literally no one here i don't think has a horse if you have a horse that's pretty cool but really like why is this important and i kind of talked about this a little bit but like why is it actually important and why does it even matter right well like i was saying it's really important for uh oh yeah okay it is really important for like our body and how we actually digest like sugars and how we actually get our energy, right? And we have to remember that since our body's made up of tons and tons of cells, like it's made up of a lot of, a lot of cells, right? And each of those cells are carrying out like individual like processes and everything like that. And so what's happening is when we have each cell carrying out some process to break down sugar, right? It's going to happen. And then all together, it's gonna help us feel more energetic, have more energy because of that. And that's why it's important because we can continue to go through our life and keep eating food and just keep feeling energy, but not knowing why. And that's where we can start to understand like, oh, why are there some, like some of these diseases that we hear about? Or like, how does this, how can we make sure that we actually get enough energy? And stuff like this is very important actually. And I don't think a lot of people sometimes don't recognize that because um, a lot of times when you learn about the cells, it's very just like, oh my gosh, it's just a cell. Why does it even matter? So that's why I really wanted to talk about that. 
And I also wanted to like ask you guys a little bit about what, what, what do you guys think about this? Like, why do you guys think it's important too? So you guys can definitely type in the chat. And then Kathy, once you get responses, you can read them out for sure. Yep, got it. So if you have any ideas, just maybe a guess or anything like that, just make sure to type it down in chat. All right, so Zachary said, because it is interesting. Let's see. It is very interesting. <laughs> any other ideas? Yeah, does anyone else have any interesting ideas? And like, again, just, just take, a, take a guess at it. There's no right or wrong. I wanna hear like what you guys are thinking. Yep, you can message it to me privately or send it out in the chat. Okay, right. so in that case then, oh, do you have one right now? Um, oh, someone's, oh, never mind. It's a Zoom thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so then, then we'll keep going. Okay, so once again, like we're saying, this is happening in our body, which is why it's so important. And let's, let's actually take a little time to think about why it's happening. Cause we often just go through all this like super in-depth stuff, but we don't understand like why it's important. Okay. Yep. This is how we get energy from our food. And this in turn is going to drive all life. Like even, even other animals do this. And actually um, I'm not going to say the answer right now, but some other organisms that are green hint, hint, also do cellular respiration too. Yeah, so here, like, let's think about it, right? Let's think about like this, this is the different levels, right? So we have the organism, which is just, we can think of it as like a bison, right? And it's carrying out like this, this like cellular, uh, trying to get energy from the food, right? And then you can go up and then say, well, there's more bison. And then you have like a group, of, like an area where there's a bunch of, um, the bison and other animals. And all these animals are still doing cellular respiration. They're still getting energy from their food, right? Because if they don't get energy from their food, how else are they gonna be able to actually like, like why would they eat, right? If they didn't get energy from their food, why would they eat? And then if they didn't get energy from their food, they wouldn't be able to survive. And so that's really just like a fundamental basis. Even for cells, they also need like sugars to survive. So that's something very important to think about. And if you were to think about it, like if we ate and we didn't get any nutrients, anything from that, how would that affect the whole world, right? Because if animals ate, like let's say a sheep ate grass and it didn't get any uh, nutrients from it, then there would be no more sheep, there'd be no more nothing, right? So that's why it so, has such a big implication because we talk about like stuff like habitat destruction, right? Or like current stuff like uh, global warming going on, right? But there's also like this very fundamental part of breaking down food that if we did not have, no one would be able to survive, right? So yeah, and here on the right, we're gonna talk a little bit too about the digestive system and how on a bigger sc scale, how like our food goes to our stomach and then how that like works in breaking it down. Okay, so we're gonna go back to it. Here's the mighty mitochondria. Yeah, so there, here's like all the complex stuff. It has like so much information, looks overwhelming. But thankfully, we're just going to put a smiley face on that and I'm just going to keep going because we don't need to know all this super detailed stuff. If you definitely want to learn more about it, you can definitely like go online or you can tell me and I can definitely explain it more. But I want to make sure everyone has like a good base like understanding before we just start delving into like really deep stuff too. Here is the overview. So we can think of glycolysis. Once again, just a big word. Uh, don't be too scared of it. It's just breaking down glucose into the very first, very first like stage. And then it goes inside the, you can think of like, think of it maybe like a factory, right? As a truck coming in with the sugars and then, or how about this? How about this? How about we say we're making pencils? So there's a truck coming in with like wood, right? Then it's going to go into this factory here. And then what's going to happen is the wood is going to be processed, right? Because if the wood is just a log, you can't just use that to make it pencil. You have to cut off the bark. You have to make sure it's all smooth and you cut it up in like pieces or you make like, you make sawdust, which is where they just make a bunch of dust out of the wood and they put it back together. 
And then, then you have to reshape that into a pencil. You have to put the, the lead inside so you can write. So there's a lot of different processes that happen. And this is the same thing with breaking down sugar. It's not like just like boop, press a button and the whole thing's broken down and we're good to go. It's a little more complex, but it, once again, is not that bad. It's very like, it's actually simple compared to a lot of the other stuff we've already learned. Yeah, here's just the structure a little bit of the mitochondria. Don't need to get into too much about it, but we can think of it like um, inside there's almost like a uh, mitochondria has like a, it's like a bag inside of another bag because it has the two membranes. So it's kind of, like I said, just a bag inside of a bag. And that just helps with remembering like what the actual structure looks like because that'll help in the future. Now here I have a bunch of sports cars that are driving like really fast, uh, excuse me, fast, right? So in the next slide, I'm going to ask you guys, why do you think this is even related, right? Why would I put a bunch of sports cars? And I'm talking about us like using, uh, using, getting energy from our fuel and stuff like that. So like, why would it, why would it even be related? So what do you guys actually think, right? Like how are sports, sports cars going to be an analogy for cellular respiration? So are they, they cool? They're just cool. Like cellular respiration. Maybe that's why I put it or they're fast, like cellular respiration is very fast maybe, or they're not related and I really like sports cars or they use fuel like our body uses fuel. So make sure you guys vote. Okay, we'll give everyone a couple more seconds. Make sure you guys vote. Okay, we can end the polling now. Yeah, so great job. They use fuel like our body uses food, right? Because I'm going to show you through here how they use like gasoline. And really what's happening is gasoline is like one form of energy, right? And then they're just using that to go forward. Just like how for us, we eat sugars, we eat food. That's our energy. And that's how we get our energy to go do whatever we need to do, go play basketball, go swimming, go like do whatever we need to do. So then that's why is really, I think it's really nice is that like the sports cars, it makes it easier to sometimes understand too. Yep. So great job. Here we have gasoline, right? So if we just had a sports car by itself, no gas, no nothing, then like what we're going to do, right? We, it looks nice, but we can't move. This guy's going very fast in the sports car, right? So it needs gasoline to really use that energy because in the engine is it's basically kind of breaking down the gasoline and then it's making it so then that that can be turned into like the the wheels turning and so that's how it's using gasoline as energy however we could also use the gasoline as energy but let's say we use something more forceful right because we go back here inside the engine it's making like smaller like breaking down right it's not it's not like just releasing a bunch of energy all at once. Because a lot of times, if you think about it, right, you know how factories or like the trains used to use the coal and the fire to drive the trains, right? And then, but they wouldn't just like put a huge like fire that's blowing through the entire train and then put a bunch of coal and make it bigger and bigger to make the train go faster. No, because that would just ruin the whole point. And also a lot of the fire would just not be able to, heat the water or do anything else because it'd just be outside of the train. So it'd be just like a waste of energy. Well, that's the same thing here, right? The gasoline is very flammable, which is why it's good for like an engine because you can use like smaller, smaller steps to break it down, make energy, and then you can use that for the car. But if we use another source of like energy, this like lighter, and then we add it to the gasoline, I'm pretty sure you guys can guess what happens, but our poor car just like blows up because it's too sudden. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, we're releasing all of this energy all at once. And as, a fi as you know from a fire, it releases a bunch of heat. But a lot of times you can't do anything, right? If you're trying to break down sugar, how is like burning everything going to help? If you're trying to drive in your sports car like fast, right? How is that going to help if your sports car just blows up? No, we don't want that. We want it instead go back. We want it inside the engine. We want the pistons kind of moving and then moving the wheels and that way we can drive in. So that's really like a good analogy to what our bodies are doing. Instead of breaking down the sugar all in one time and releasing a ton of energy, 
they're doing these little steps and that is breaking it down. And then each step releases like a little energy. The same thing with a sports car. So that's just something interesting to keep in mind too. Yeah, this is what they're talking about, right? Gasoline is just like sugar in our bodies. And this is like a cell here. We do cellular respiration and we get this thing called ATP. You don't even worry about it. It's just energy. Here, we do the same thing, except it's just a little different in the engine. And then we get movement here. And then we get energy and then we can use that for our cells to move around. Like even as I'm talking to you, it requires energy that I had from maybe my dinner or my lunch, right? So that's really like a very important part because if we couldn't break it down, like I was saying, then nothing would exist really because we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be able to use our energy and we wouldn't be able to use our food to get energy too. Now you may be noticing a very interesting thing here is that heat is released. Well, think about the, the engine, right? We have our car, we're putting in the gasoline, you start the car, the hood is hot. So the very front of the car, it's hot. It's not like you can just stick your hand in the engine and you'll be okay. No, it's very, very hot. That's because when it's doing these little reactions, right? It's controlled, but it's still a little bit like that fire. It's not like the crazy big, like the whole car blows up, but it's kind of controlled more and it's still releasing heat. And just remember that heat is kind of like that energy, right? Cause we're getting energy to keep ourselves warm. Cause like, we're our body temperature, I believe is like around 98.5 like degrees Fahrenheit. Right. And we're always there. We don't really go all the way down to like 47 degrees. We don't go up to like 120. Why is that? Well, when it gets cold, our body is still making heat so we can still stay like warm and at like an okay temperature. And then when we start to work out and then we get really hot, that's because we need more sugar and more food to make more energy and then use that energy maybe when we're playing basketball, we're going swimming like that. So that's a very interesting thing too, is that it's kind of releasing heat on the side. And I, I kind of gave away this one, but we can definitely keep going. So like what keeps us warm, right? Inside, even though it's cold outside. So I'm not gonna give everyone that much time for this one because it should be pretty clear which answer it is, but. I think it'd be very interesting if we actually had a fire inside of us, or it'd be really cool if we did photosynthesis, then we wouldn't have to eat anything. We just stand outside and then just, just get a bunch of energy from that. It'd be cool. Yeah. We'll give everyone just like five more seconds. This should be almost hopefully a no brainer if you're paying attention. Yep. So it's definitely cellular respiration. Cause I was just talking about how cellular respiration releases heat, on the side, right? That's not the main reason we're doing it. It's just, it just happens to be like that. And then our bodies still stay warm, even though it's cold. And, oh yeah, here's a good question that I kind of hinted at too, right? Do plants do cellular respiration? We talked about how plants do photosynthesis, but do they do cellular respiration? So it's a very interesting thing to think about too. And we're actually gonna do a little bit of like comparing because if you look at what we're starting with for like cellular respiration, what we're starting with for photosynthesis, and then what we end up with at the end, right? Cause we break down the sugars, then we get, then we get energy. Then like you can actually look and see there's actually some similarities. Some stuff is the same and it is very interesting too. Okay, we can stop the polls now. Yeah, so a lot of people were correct on this one. I thought this would trick you guys more, but it didn't. So they actually do cellular respiration. Because if you remember all the way back from my cells uh, seminar, if you don't remember, you can check it out on our YouTube. But we talked about the plant cell, right? The plant cell, if you look inside, it actually does have the mitochondria. And the mitochondria are responsible for the cellular respiration. And if you think about a plant too, right? It also needs to do cellular respiration because photosynthesis makes the sugars. But how do they break down the sugars? It's not like you just have sugar in your body and then you immediately get like energy or you, you eat something and you immediately get energy. It's not how it works. Photosynthesis is like how plants like eat sort of, right? Cause we get our energy from eating like food that we, we take during the day or during our lunchtime. Right. And that's how we get our energy, but plants don't have like a mouth to really eat. So then they just get it from the sun. They make the sugars, but then they need to break them down. Cause otherwise they just have a bunch of sugar or starch. And then they're like, what do I do? And by the way, if you don't know, starch is just something that's, that plants make and it's in like potatoes 
or a lot of the roots too. So that's a very interesting thing too. Yeah, so here we are again, glycolysis is a very beginning one. Then this is pyruvate oxidation. Once again, a big word, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. This, this one is really, like I was saying, we talk about the, the wood analogy. We gotta prepare it before we go and actually make the pencils, right? We gotta take off the bark, gotta make sure it's ready. Then we put it into the, this thing called the citric acid cycle. And you may be wondering like why. I believe it's actually because like, just, just the way it was named is also, it goes by a different name by like the scientists too. And so we can think about this if we're using our pencil analogy, we take off the bark at this oxidation thing. Remember glycolysis was where the, the wood came in with the truck, take off the bark. Then here we're gonna like cut it probably into either like, we'll, we'll, let's say we'll, we'll grind it up into sawdust, right? And we're gonna make the pencils from that. Then we go here, this is a big step. We put like all the sawdust together and then we just like reform it into a pencil. And there's some other steps too that we just like maybe add the lead and then add like the eraser and then we're good to go. There was this like complicated diagram, but I just want to summarize it over here. So just remember glucose turns into another thing that turns into two of these things and then just gets changed again. So the main thing, as always, we're thinking about biology, we're looking at this, is that it just goes through a series of changes. It's just being changed so it can get ready for at the very end when it has to be in this special form in order to actually go through and be broken down. And at each step, we're changing it and we're kind of breaking it down. See over here, don't worry about the names. They, they might look confusing, don't worry about them. We start off with like six here, right? Breaks in half, we're already breaking it down. Then we go here and then we're breaking it down more, even more till, um, till we go to the bottom here. If you look at the very bottom, see we have like, we lost different parts of it too, which is okay because we want it to be more simple. So that way it's easier for us to use it. Cause you look at the very top, we have like six circles, right? That's like a pretty big sugar, but we want to break it down again. So we break it and then we break it in half just like over here too. So we start off with the sugar, we change it a little bit, we break it in half, and then we change it a little bit. And so for each like of the sugar ones, we get two of the end products here, which is just the little like three circle thing too. And this is actually like very interesting too, because this is what I was talking about, the like pyruvate thing, right? Over here, this is where we're taking off the bark because once again, what do we see? We're just changing it, so we're making it more simple. And then that way, when we go to the next step, it's easy, it's done. We're making it more simple, and then we're getting ready and then doing it. Just like we can use eggs as an example, right? You're not gonna eat a raw egg, no. You need, to, you need to cook it first, just like this. We start off with the raw ingredients, and then we need to end up with something that we can actually eat and not get sick from, you know? So that's why we start with the raw egg, Maybe like use the cooking, cooking oil, make scrambled eggs, and then we can eat the scrambled eggs. So just remember that, okay? Don't worry, don't get too much into the details. Here, this is the whole cycle, but again, look at it. Look at this, right? We're just losing these little circles, and if you're really interested, the circles kind of represent like carbon, which is just a very important element, and we'll get more into that in like a future, future video too. But they're just breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down, et cetera, et cetera. And then they just keep doing that and they're, they're just adding it and then making sure it's ready. Cause we can also think about it like this, right? Let's say you want to buy your favorite pencil again and you need to buy it from someplace like Amazon. Well, Amazon's not going to be like, Oh, here's a pencil. And they're just going to throw it at you. No, they're not going to be like that. They need to put it, maybe some put in like some of those air packet things. So it doesn't like get crushed then they need to put it in a box. They need to kind of label the box. They need to put it in a truck that's gonna ship it to you. So there's a lot of processes and we can think about this in like our everyday life too, right? And that's why I was using this egg example because it's just so similar to what we're doing every day. We're not, we're not just taking the raw stuff and eating it. We don't eat raw meat, we cook it. We don't eat raw eggs, we cook it. 
the, the Amazon delivery guy does not just give us a random pencil off the street. No, he puts it in a box. He makes sure it's the right address. So there's a lot of stuff that we can see in biology is really just like real life. Yeah. And then, so I talked a little bit about it, but once again, remember, it's just an orange. <laughs> no, just remember, it's not that important and that we're breaking it down at each step. Here, once again, we have a chicken, right? But like, how do we get the chicken nuggets? Well, we have to do a lot of things to the chicken and then we have to go through a very big process before we actually have chicken nuggets on our plate. So just another example. Now here we have, this is the last step over here. So let me see if I can go back here. Yeah, go back right here. Um, this is just like another word, but electron transport chain. Do you remember that? If you guys don't remember, make sure you rewatch that photosynthesis video. But here we were with the, the photosynthesis, we had the same thing, right? I used the analogy, I was saying, oh, you're at a fair, you need to charge your phone. And then you're charging your phone. And then there's a lot of people that wanna go inside the fair. And so then they're all going this way. You can think about the like H plus, pretend those are people. And so like they wanna go across, but then you have to make a phone call each time to let them across. And then at the very end of the day, you have those little, the exit, only one exit, right, for the fair. And then to the little like spin, the little spin uh, like gate things. And so every time someone spins it, it makes some energy. So that's exactly what's happening here, right? We're pushing all of this across to one side and then it's coming back, spinning this little like spinner and then it's making energy from that. And just so you guys know for future reference that that was really all that the other steps were trying to do. They're trying to break it down so that we can move these people, you can think of them as people, across, and then when they come back, they can make energy. So it's just like that. Yep, now we're gonna talk about something very interesting, like I was saying, the equation, right? The equation really is just like, what do we start off with? What do we end with? It might look like complicated stuff, but I'm gonna explain it, and you guys are gonna understand it pretty well. And there's a really, really big connection. Just first of all, just don't even worry too much about it right now, but look at this. So we have this like CH whatever, whatever, but we see there's like six zero or six O and then CHO, right? Wait a second, it's over here. But this is the one for photosynthesis and this is for cellular respiration, right? Wait a second, and then we go over here, we see, oh wait, this is also over here. So they're really connected and let me explain. This is just sugar. That's it. It's just sugar. That's it. This is oxygen. So when we are breathing in, we're using that oxygen to make our energy. And then we need to obviously eat the food because how else are we going to make energy? We, we can't make it from nothing. So we eat the food, breathe in air. And when we breathe out, it's carbon dioxide. So that was something that we had at the end. And then we also, if you, that's a really cool experiment, right? You go to maybe your window or uh, yeah, window or mirror, you breathe like this. And then you, you look, and you're like, wait a second, why is there water? That's because in your breath, like you, when you breathe out, there's actually little tiny, really tiny water droplets. And so that's the water. Once again, if you remember what I was saying very like recently, ATP is just energy. So it makes sense. We're breathing in, eating the, the sugar, then breathing out carbon dioxide, breathing out water, and then also having that energy. Here, we have photosynthesis, right? The plants taking carbon dioxide. Okay, that makes sense, right? And then they take in water. That makes sense too, right? Because if you don't water, your plant's gonna die. Then they take that, they use the sunlight. And remember the chlorophyll, that's just like the color, right? So it's okay. So they use the sunlight, then they make sugar, and then they release oxygen. Now, a very important thing, I think like many of you will probably have a question right now. You're like, Wait, but I remember from the healthy eating, you said sugar was a bad thing. Yeah, so when we're talking about like the more biology side of sugar is different. There's so many different types of sugars, right? You may have looked at like a Coke can that says zero sugar, but then you drink it and it's sweet. So you're like, how does that not have sugar? Well, there's something called artificial sweetener. It's kind of like fake sugar, but it's like, it's really bad for you. What they did is they took sugar and then like condensed it so it's even more sweet and then condensed it so it's even more sweet and they kept doing it and doing it and doing it till they can just add a very, very tiny amount 
and the thing will be really sweet. And oftentimes this is actually like to show you how bad it is. It's worse than just having normal sugar. Like that's how bad it is. Like this artificial sweetener stuff that they put in a lot of the sodas by ha like by drinking it, it's really bad for you. And it's even worse than just having normal soda with sugar, which already we talked about was pretty bad. So that shows you how, how like how negative it can be and really what it can do to you. So that's why when we think about in biology, obviously you eat stuff that may not have sugar, right? Like, let's say you eat a potato. I was saying there's starch in there. Well, this is just the general idea, right? Because there's a lot of different cases when you're gonna eat stuff that's not sugar, but you can body still break it down. And that's where it gets a little more complex, which is why we're focusing here. And we're saying, hey, this, this sugar part is just like a fill in the blank. Maybe you ate starch, maybe you ate potatoes. So it'd be like potatoes. Maybe you eat bread, it'd be bread. So it's not always sugar which is why they're just using it as an example. And we need to remember that too. And like, also there's many other things that can break down. Your body's not like, oh, I must only have sugar because obviously we see you eat a lot of sugar in your lifetime, you're not healthy. So there's a lot of different other things that you can have and that you really should be having besides sugar. Yep, here was the correlation. The correlation is a big word for they're the same. And also here we see they're the same as well. Yeah, here's a really cool video that I really felt like summarized it. And yeah, so I'll definitely make sure you guys can hear it and then we'll play it. Welcome to Moo Moo Math and Cellular Respiration. All living things practice cellular respiration. This includes bacteria, fungi, plants, and animals. But why is cellular respiration important? It is important because living organisms generate energy for daily activities with cellular respiration. In plants and animals, cellular respiration takes place at the mitochondria. Think of the mitochondria as a power plant for the cell because the energy of the cell is generated at the mitochondria. Just like these power plants and turbines in this video generate power for their city. Cells that need more energy have more mitochondria, like muscles. At the mitochondria, the sugar combines with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide plus water and energy in the form of ATP. This process of cellular respiration generates energy to help keep living organisms alive. Thanks for watching. Moo Math uploads. Yeah, so I thought that was a really good video to recap what we're doing. And I realized that here before we get into here i would like to go over any questions that people have because i know we covered like a lot of content and i want to make sure i clarify anything for anyone all right so we do have a few questions the first one is what is the difference between muscle and fat okay so yes there is a difference and when i was talking about how like when cells have extra energy right that they didn't use to work out or to do like exercising well what happens right and we'll actually see that these these cells will actually just be because remember not all cells look exactly the same a lot of them are different we were talking about this in our cell seminar too and many of them have different shapes they don't have the same like organelles they usually have basic ones but there's really a lot of variation it's not all the same so a lot of cells that are like the quote unquote fat cells, they'll have these big like globs of kind of fat inside to store it for energy. 
And then when the cells need energy, they'll just use those and then they'll like break it down for energy. The difference is with muscle is the cells are very like sleek and they're all connected very like tightly. So that way, like when we, when I'm moving my hand, I can like clench it like very hard, right? On my fist, but then I can also like release it at the same time. So what they're doing is they're kind of like, they're, they're relaxed, right? But then they're like contracting, which means they're being like pulled. So like we can think about it, like maybe when we flex like our arm, right? So right now it's very like, it's very just like relaxed, right? But then when we flex it, it becomes very tight up here and then just like everything tightens up. So in order for that to happen, they have to be really like connected together and then also be able to kind of stretch a little bit and then relax, but then be like stretched again. So we see this girl here who's like lifting weights. Like you can see that this part where you see my cursor is being contracted. So it's being like pressured on and then you're bringing it in to make it even like more condensed. So the muscle cells are really some of the most interesting because they can move, they have some like ability to stretch and kind of move together because they're so connected together. And that's really one of the most important things. And also not only thinking about muscles like, oh, my arm has a lot of muscle or I'm really a good runner. So my legs have a lot of muscle. Your heart is actually a muscle too. And so do your lungs. Cause how else are they going to like, like how are they going to expand when you breathe and then like close again, like how are they can get bigger and then close when you breathe in and out. Or how's your heart going to keep like pumping the blood? It needs to be a muscle too. Yeah. So that was a really good question. Do you have another one? Yep. We certainly do. Yeah. That answer really explained a lot. So our next question is why is it called cellular respiration? Yeah. So um, like we were talking about with the fancy scientific words, right? Respiration, just the word respiration actually can mean like breathing, just the, just you breathing in, breathing out. But then people realize that like, that's not really correct because it sort of is right. Maybe like we're breathing in oxygen and then we're releasing carbon dioxide in cellular respiration and that's with breathing. But then they were like, uh, that's not really right. So then they just said cellular, which means like cell. So it's really on the cell level that they were focusing more, more on. All right, thank you for the answer. So basically it's cell breathing. That's the layman's term. All right, yeah. uh, can we take one more question or are you short on time? Yeah, we can definitely take one more. All right, so our next question is what is ATP? Okay, I'm gonna say a very big scientific word. It's adenine triphosphate. All that means, okay, if you remember anything from the DNA, right? Adenine is just the A in the DNA, right? So like when we have the base pairs, the A we were saying goes with T, G with C, that's actually the same A. And then tri, just think about like tricycle has three wheels, that just means three. And phosphate, was if we go back, I believe, go back all the way back, then we can see over here, you just see this little P. And then we see over here too, this little P. And then uh, I'm just gonna focus one, one place here, phosphate. That's just the, the phosphate right there. So it's adenine, which was the, the DNA base, right? Tri, which means three, and then phosphate. So it's really just like the adenine plus three little like P's like that, three little phosphate. And that's what it stands for. But then obviously you won't, you won't be like, oh, did you know the cells have adenine triphosphate? Like that's too big of a word. So then they shortened it to ATP. But once, like, what, like I was saying before, right? Because all of these words have meaning. They're not just like random words that scientists made up just for fun. No, they actually correspond to actual stuff, right? We look at like bi, bi means two, phosphate. Oh, there's two Ps here. So it makes sense. It's not like they're just randomly, hmm, which big word can I use today? They're really trying to actually make it even simpler because that way, once you know like different parts of the word, you can look at the word and be like, oh wait, so it has a phosphate and then tri means three. Oh wait, I remember adenine. So then, oh, adenine three and then phosphate. Okay, that makes sense. So that's really what's happening when they're naming stuff. So yeah, we're going to go on. And then at the very end, if we have any more questions, we can definitely answer those. Here, I'm going to be talking about something else, right? 
when, when we're doing cellular respiration, there's actually a different option. Sometimes your cells don't always go through the mitochondria. Sometimes they just, they just do, a, it's a kind of like a separate process in the cytoplasm. If you remember, the cytoplasm is almost like the juice that the cells are in. And what they do is something called fermentation. So if you've ever been working out, right? And then let's say you work out and then you feel good. And then the next day you work out the same muscle and you're like, man, that like really hurts. Like, why does that hurt so much? And then that's why they put this like, before you work out, make sure you stretch, you know, make sure you get like kind of loose and get, get all ready and stretch before you work out. That's because there's this thing called lactic acid. You may have heard of it. It's just another product, right? So when we have cellular respiration, we end up with breathing out carbon dioxide, having energy, and then breathing out a little bit of water, right? Well, this time, this one actually does not need oxygen. And I, I repeat, it does not need oxygen. Fermentation does not need oxygen, right? And then what's happening is it's actually taking some of the sugar and then it's making a very, very small like amount of energy. So you can see here, just by doing this, we get like two ATP. It's just a way to measure energy, right? If you looked at like going back here to this, this process here, like going back to the overview that we were talking about. So the glycolysis is right here, right? This is not inside the mitochondria. This right here, two ATP. But over here, doing the entire process, wait for it, is around like around 36. Can you believe that? So only two, how could, how could we even survive doing that, right? Well, to be honest, humans cannot survive just making that because there's not enough energy and we're not getting enough from it because we need, we need a lot of energy, right? We need to be able to think. We need to be able to move around, have fun, laugh. We need to do a lot of things. So that's why we really need to be able to get as much energy as possible. But sometimes there's not enough oxygen. So it's like the plan B, right? Let's say you're a secret agent and then something goes wrong. You're like, oh no, I need to do plan B. Well, that's what's happening in the cells. They're like, okay, well, I can't go through this because I don't have oxygen, but I can still make a little bit of energy. The problem is, of course, you probably have felt it, is that it makes the lactic acid, which makes your muscles really like hurt a lot, but it's actually okay because after a while, the lactic acid will go away. That's why it's important to stretch because if you don't stretch and then you start working out, it's going to really, really hurt. But you stretch a little bit, you know, like do the arm stretch and like do the arm stretch, right? It'll relax the muscles and kind of release that. So then it's not that bad. Over here, the fermentation thing, like this is also to do with making cheese and yogurt. That's how, because remember we said there's actually like little bacteria in yogurt. I showed you with my microscope that I was doing the pretty cool experiment. Yeah, there's actually like bacteria there, right? And bacteria, since they're usually just like one cell, you know what they can do? They don't need to do, they don't need mitochondria. They don't need all this complex like stuff, right? They just, they'd be like, okay, well, I'll just break it down. Two ATP is enough for them because our body has trillions of cells. They have like around like one cell and sometimes maybe like what, five cells? It, it depends, but it's very, very small. So then they can get away with doing that. And that's why we have all the cheese, all the yogurt. And this is the ATP here. Here we see there's this like the three phosphate part, right? This is each, each one of these is just the phosphates. That's why it has a P in the middle. Just remember the P. This is just the adenine, that's it. And now we're gonna go over like what happens to the food in our body when we eat it. But we're gonna talk about it more like how it goes through our digestive system because I think we're doing great. We've covered the cellular part, but how does it look like when we have a tummy ache or like, how does it look like when we have other things that are happening or different, you know, you've heard of maybe diseases that can happen with your body like that. So we're going to go over that too. Here we have a, a very cool little picture here is a journey of a cheeseburger. So what it does is it, this one's really good because it shows you really what happens throughout your entire body, right? Let's say you eat the cheeseburger, your stomach, is gonna actually break down the really big pieces. And you can think of your stomach almost like your hand, right? Let's say you put something in here and you just start crushing it like this. That's what your stomach's doing. It needs to break it down into very, very tiny pieces, right? Then here, the small intestine is the next part. 
and then just small intestine and then eventually big and in large intestine but small intestine just remember it kind of uses like the the more there's a little bit of acid in the stomach but also small intestine breaks it down a little bit more and then then what will actually happen is some some of the nutrients will go into our blood that's why if you actually uh drink water drink a lot of water um the the water will actually go to your like kidneys first it won't just go straight to your bladder so that's also how the nutrients kind of get into our blood and go through our whole body because often you've probably heard like oh the heart is so important it transports oxygen it gets rid of carbon dioxide it also transports nutrients you might be like oh yeah oxygen carbon wait wait nutrients like how does it do that well it just because we're breaking it down very small then it's going to put in the sugars or starch or just the stuff that our cells need so that way it can go through our body here here's the liver yeah this is a great example here you kind of have like that um the the like filter like let's say let's say you need to like drain the water out of like your delicious spaghetti well you need to drain it right so then and you need to catch maybe the spaghetti so this is just like this before before you like release all this stuff you want to make sure that there's nothing bad in it and that's what kind of our liver does then the large intestines like hey before before we're done here i need to get all the water because we need to make sure we're not just losing tons of water and then eventually it just exits the body here yeah there's a great a great like more realistic look here we go down the mouth onto the journey and then we go this is the esophagus that's just the thing like right here so you can think of it like if you're taking a road from your mouth to your stomach, if that's the road and you just drive down there, right? Going to the stomach, again, we're talking about how it like mashes it, the food up, then it's all connected and it just keeps going through this path, small intestine, then large intestine, and that's like really how it works. So let's start with the very first part, our mouth. You might be like, oh, our mouth is really good because I get to taste the food. Yeah, that's true, but it's also really important because it breaks the food down first. It's the very first thing that breaks down the food. Like we look at, uh, this is Patrick here. We have, we have this delicious, delicious like pie and stuff he's eating. He's chewing it and then he also has a saliva, but the saliva, if you actually noticed, it has like a little bit of salt in it and then that helps and a little bit of enzymes to like break it down. So in your mouth already, before it's even gone through your body, it's already starting to get break, bro broken down. And that's why it's really important we have teeth to really grind it up and make it into smaller pieces. Then once we, once we go to our stomach, then it'll break it up even more and then keep doing that until there's the, all the nutrients are gone. And you may have noticed like, hey, I can't just swallow an entire apple. <laughs> yeah, that's not how it works because our body wants you to break it down before it goes to the stomach because the stomach can only do so much. You can't just give it a full pie and then expect it to try to break that down. It's like too much for us. We need to break it down a little bit in the beginning. Here, yeah, we have the stomach area, right? So we're eating this um, amazing eating contest here. I hope it's not making you too hungry, but, and then like we have the, we're gonna go on next to the stomach and that's where the food is gonna go after we've already broken it down and it goes down to the stomach for being broken down again. And this is really interesting, right? Because we we're just talking about how cellular respiration breaks down stuff, right? Breaks down like the sugar or the starch or the other stuff too. But we see it's the same thing too with actually eating the food, not even on the cell level. Eating the food, we have to break it down into smaller pieces as well. Here's a really cool animation I saw of the stomach here. This is just an animation and it shows how your stomach is not, it's not just like staying there. It's like really just moving because it wants to be able to like um, crush the food as much as possible. So it needs to be able to move around. It can't just be like one and then close. No, it needs to get like all the food and then really crush it. Here's another cool part about the, the stomach here. It's been like a little highlighted. And another fun fact too, right? The stomach is actually a muscle. Let's look back at this. How is something going to be able to move like that, right? Because we're talking about how muscles, how they can relax and then contract, which means like pull apart sort of a little bit and then relax again. That allows for us to like me to move my hands like this or me to move my arms or my head, anything in my body, right? Same thing with our stomach. It's making these motions because it's able 
to use the muscles and then like move and then like um, basically kind of clench, which means like when you flex your muscle, you're clenching it because you're making it tighter and then make it like relax and then just keep doing that. Yeah, now we're gonna talk about the small intestine. So you may be wondering like, man, why does it have so many folds, right? Well, it's really important that it has a lot of folds and we're actually gonna get to a really cool fact about it too. But it's important it has a lot of folds so that it can really um, catch, capture as much nutrients as possible. We're gonna look at a certain part of the small intestine which makes it very good for capturing nutrients from our food. Because you may be wondering, well, why, why is it able to do that? You know, like what, what special properties does it have? Okay, here's the fun fact. This is actually true. I searched it up, it's, I, like, it's true. Your small intestine is 22 feet long. Can you believe that? Like, I thought that was absolutely crazy that like, it's just all like kind of packaged up here, but it's, if you were to stretch it out, it'd be 22 feet long. That's like actually crazy. I, I thought that was so amazing. Here we have, this is the, uh, this is a large, large intestine. So you can see it's actually like bigger. It's like physically bigger because after it's been like all broken down, it's going to start to collect a little bit and then get bigger, a little bit bigger too. This one, however, is only five feet long. So it's not as cool as a small intestine. Now, I want to ask you a question, right? Because, like, what is the difference between the large and small intestines, right? There, there is no difference, maybe. Or maybe the difference is in the word, large and small. That's the difference. Or the, the large intestine is going to take out the last of the water, like we were saying. Or, like, or maybe it's just, like, smaller. So I want to see what you guys think. Make sure you guys vote here because I want to I wanna get through the end, too. So we're going to give everyone just a couple more seconds. Make sure you put in your votes. Yeah, we can close the votes now. Okay, we're almost at 100%. So yeah, that's correct. It's B. The large intestine, we're saying, takes out the last of the water, make sure that we're not wasting a lot of water, right? And then also takes some like nutrients but the small intestine is more the first round of actually absorbing the food. Mouth breaks it down, stomach breaks it up, then small intestine starts absorbing, then large intestine takes a lot of the water out. But how do the intestines absorb nutrients? How? Well, there's actually these little kind of like really, really microscopic little arm things that are actually made up of cells here and these cells are responsible because if you look, there's a lot of space in between it for like little food to get trapped. But at this point, the food is really broken down. So that's why at the very small, small level, the nutrients kind of get trapped here and then the cells can kind of take that in and then they can use that. And also you might be noticing a weird thing here, like what, what is this, right? Why, I understand the cells, right? And I understand like, oh, okay, they're kind of spread out, but what, what is this blue, like green, like what, what is this? Well, actually the cells are right next to some very, very small like blood vessels. And what it'll actually do, actually do is after it kind of like breaks down some of the nutrients, right? It'll actually put it inside of the, the little vessels and it'll be like, you can think about it like a delivery guy or like a, a ship going on an ocean, uh, going on a trip on the ocean. And then it'll go through the blood vessels and then go somewhere else spread some nutrients and then keep going like that. You also may be wondering, why is it blue? Is our blood blue? Here's a really interesting fact. The reason a lot of the diagrams are actually like half blue, half red is not because our skin's actually blue. You might be looking like, oh wait, but on my skin, like you look underneath on my veins, they, they look blue. So there must be blue blood. No, that's not how it works. And people have also said, well, yeah, that is how it works. Cause see if you, if you have blood like outside in the air, then that's, that'll turn it red. But no, that's not how it works because think about it. Oxygen is already in the blood because we're using the blood to spread the oxygen around the body. So that wouldn't make sense that because the blood doesn't have oxygen that it's blue. It's actually because your skin 
is kind of making it look look really weird because the way with the lighting it'll actually make it look like blue because your skin has like many different layers and the reason they chose blue was actually to show hey there's different parts of a blood vessel it's not just one big thing and they wanted to show different parts but they were like they were like how do i do that it's all red so then they wanted to change it to a different color and they chose it blue because it'd be like contrast if they chose like red and light red they'd be like oh it's the same thing so they wanted to show some contrast but i don't think they really understood that a lot of people would mistake it and think oh my blood's actually blue when it's not here we're gonna go over this is a cool really cool like cellular respiration video i actually used to watch like a little bit of brain pop when i was a kid and i thought it was really fun because he always has this friend like the robot so here we go um Mind. I'm trying to concentrate on my breathing here. Dear Tim and Moby, is respiration the same thing as breathing? From Chad. <sighs> I'm practicing deep breathing. But breathing and respiration are two different things. Breathing is part of the respiratory system, a group of organs that delivers oxygen from the air we breathe to cells throughout the body. Respiration, or cellular respiration to be exact, is what living cells do with that precious oxygen. Right, we all need oxygen to survive, but did you ever stop to wonder why? Yep, that's what I thought. We use oxygen to process glucose, a simple sugar that provides all the energy that cells need to function. All day long, your digestive system is busy breaking down food and turning it into glucose to power your cells. Glucose, along with oxygen from your lungs, is delivered to your cells through your bloodstream. These substances undergo a chemical reaction called respiration inside tiny cellular structures called mitochondria. When the reaction is complete, three things are left over. An energy-packed molecule called ATP, water, and the waste gas carbon dioxide. Your cells expel the carbon dioxide into your blood, which carries it to your lungs. When you breathe out, you're exhaling this carbon dioxide. Since carbon dioxide is a harmful waste gas, your body needs to get rid of it. If too much carbon dioxide is allowed to build up in your blood, you die. Right, the ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and cells use it for everything that requires work. The all-important energy in ATP enables cells to synthesize complex organic molecules like DNA, RNA, and proteins. It powers the muscle contractions that allow us to move around, and so much more. That's true. Cellular respiration isn't just for humans. You'll find it happening inside the cells of all living animals, and even plants. Hmm, another good point, Moby. Because it uses oxygen, cellular respiration is also called aerobic respiration. But what happens when there's no oxygen handy? Like when you're exercising really hard and your lungs can't supply your muscle cells with all the oxygen they need. When that happens, the cells go with a backup plan called fermentation, where glucose is processed with carbon dioxide instead of oxygen. It doesn't make as much energy as aerobic respiration. And in muscle cells, it produces lactic acid as a waste product, which causes muscle cramps. But it works for a short time. This kind of respiration in which something other than oxygen is used to release the energy from glucose is called anaerobic respiration. Some organisms, like yeasts, use only anaerobic respiration. Yeah, so he was talking about some of like the, the vocab words, right? Just Again, scientists can use a lot of these like big words to mean the same thing with having, oh, using oxygen, not using oxygen. So it's really like that. Okay, now um, I'm gonna try to hurry up here a little bit because I know we're short on time. But I wanna talk about the liver because this actually is very important. And we talked a little bit about how it has like that filter kind of um, like property and function. Here's some of the functions, right? So whenever, let's say like you take medicine, if you ever notice, like let's say you had to take 
these certain medication for like a while, after a while, it doesn't work just like it used to in the beginning. That's because your liver will actually make it less toxic, which will mean that it's less effective. So let's say you're just taking some medication, uh, maybe because you have like a bacteria infection. Well, after a while, it may not work as well just because, or actually that, that was not a very good example. Let's try a different one. Let's say you're taking some for like pain, right? After a while, it's not going to work because your, your liver is going to break it down and then it's not going to work the same and you're going to need more. So that's why the doctor is very important in making sure you have the correct dosage, which means just amount. So making sure you have the correct amount is very important. And after a while, a while the same amount is not going to really change or do anything to help you. And we can also see like it has a lot of different functions. It's actually very very like useful and very important for us like blood clotting or you know a lot of other stuff like uh, helping fight infections as well and also it has like um, metabolizing and breaking down so metabolizing just means breaking down nutrients from food to help produce energy so it's also involved with the breaking down of food here this is i just want to talk about one of the diseases right what ends up happening is there's a lot of these these like diseases where if you don't take care of your body and let's say you eat too much, too much like McDonald's hamburgers or you eat too many French fries, what will happen is that fat that's going through the liver is trying to filter it. But think about a filter, right? Let's say you have some really dirty water and then you put it through a water filter and you keep doing that time and time again and it keeps going and going. Eventually you pull out the filter. It's going to be all like, like disgusting because it's trapped all the, bad stuff inside of it to prevent it from going in the water. That's the same thing here. That's why we have to be very careful what we eat because you see here reversible means, Oh, if you go to this point, you can go back. It's not that big of a deal, but eventually you go this way and then your liver becomes so damaged that no matter how much you change your diet, you can actually never go back to a healthy liver. So that's why it's very important to eat healthy and always make sure you're balancing it. Cause it's not just because you want to feel good and be more energetic. It's not really that it's also with like your actual health as well. Here we're also going to talk about the pancreas. This one's very important because it has food digesting enzymes. So that means it helps digest food, which a lot of the organs in our body you'll see actually do that too, but it also makes something called insulin insulin you may have heard of it it's something that our body will produce to help break down certain like sugars as well so there's a lot of different complex stuff happening right it's not always just like oh the cells doing this the digestive system is doing this that's it there's a lot of complex stuff that's happening and what can happen is if you eat too much sugar and you eat a lot of it and you do it throughout your life you can actually end up getting this this really like sad disease, like with it's called diabetes, where your body can no longer produce this insulin. So then you have to get it from somewhere else, right? And that's where they, what they're doing here is they're actually taking a little bit of blood and they're using this machine that's detecting how much sugar is in their blood. Usually we don't have to worry about this, right? Because the, the, the pancreas, that's the thing that makes the insulin, is like a pump almost, right? So let's say there's a lot of sugar. I was like, oh, got to put some in so there's not too much sugar in our blood. Oh, there's not enough sugar. That's okay. We just don't add any more insulin. So the insulin kind of acts as like that balance. So that way we eat a lot of sugar, then like it'll bounce it out. And then, but then it'll go back, right? We don't eat a lot of sugar. It'll just stay normal. But what they have to do is because they don't have that insulin, they have to check. Because if they get very, very high blood sugar, that can be very, very dangerous. Or if they get very, very low blood sugar, they're not going to have any energy and they can get very, very dangerous because eventually, like we're saying, the heart needs energy to pump. And if you don't have that energy, things can go very wrong. So, but, but like a big question I was talking about, like they have to get insulin from somewhere else. And so this will be one of the last questions of today is where do they actually come? Where does that insulin come from? You may be like thinking, well, maybe do we get it from donors? Cause I know there's blood donors and, or maybe like bacteria make it for us or we just dig down deep, you know, go down to the bottom of the ocean, find a magical cave that just gives us bottles. I, I think that's pretty, pretty scientific right there too. Okay, we're not gonna give that much time, so I think we can stop the polling. Yeah, 
great job. So bacteria do make it for us. And you may be like, what? That's crazy. Like, why would bacteria be able to make something we can use? Remember DNA. We can actually put DNA into the DNA of a bacteria. Then we put those bacteria inside a huge tank. So for clarification, we're putting this gene, this little part of DNA, right? The gene is a segment of DNA that normally makes insulin in our pancreas, which is the thing that makes insulin the organ in our body. So we take that gene, put it in the bacteria's DNA, then we put the bacteria in this big tank, and then it'll start to actually make insulin. Then we just get the insulin and humans can actually use it. After it's like purified and everything, they can actually use it. This is one of the biggest, like, biggest wonders, uh, biggest advances because before this, if you had diabetes, then there was no way to really treat it. And sadly, there like a lot of people passed away because of it. But now we have insulin that people can use. And if you have diabetes, it's okay. We have insulin. But again, it's a very long-term thing and it's very hard sometimes for people to manage. And that's why it's easier. You always start with your diet, always stay healthy and eating your diet and eating healthy food in your diet will really help prevent a lot of these diseases. So you don't have to worry about them in the future. So yeah, that was the end. Thank you guys for everyone coming together with me. And I really hope you guys learned a lot because I know like I really enjoyed teaching it and we can an start answering questions. So I just want to thank everyone for coming. Yep. All right. Yeah, so that's right. Thank you guys so much. And I know that's really late right now. So feel free to leave if you're short on time or anything. But we do have two or, two or three really good questions. So our first one is why is sugar also called glucose? Yeah. So sugar, um, sugar. So, okay. Glucose is a sugar, but not all sugar is glucose. So what does that mean? Glucose is a type of sugar. Sugar is like this big, big category name and glucose is like one example, but I'm going to list off a couple. Like you have sucrose. There's a lot of different other sugars that we were saying they, the, the people, the companies have like condensed to make it really sweet. And then eventually they condense it so much, it becomes something called artificial sweetener. And that's what they have in the Coke. So the glucose is like one example of sugar, but sugar is a lot of different varieties of it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. That explains a lot. All right. Our next one is if cellular respiration creates heat, then what's the deal with cold blooded animals? Don't they also produce heat when they do cellular respiration? Yeah, so the thing with cold-blooded animals is they're like, again, like throughout the entire world, there's a lot of variation. We're studying these concepts, but not everything is clear cut. Not everything's following this exact rule. So the cold-blooded uh, like reptiles, let's say we have a snake, they have to actually bask in the sun, which means like lay in the sun to warm up their body to get their metabolism going. So there's a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of different processes that are pretty specific to only like cold blooded animals. So I definitely suggest like, if you guys are interested, you can definitely like research that and learn more about it. But really it's, it's a lot different because they are relying on actually the sun's heat to help warm their own blood. And then that blood being warmed is going to allow them to really start to do a lot of the processes that they need to do, digesting food, or just, you know, like start moving around more and having that energy. Also, just a quick fun fact, you know, lizards are cold-blooded animals. So if you see lizards doing their push-ups, as I'm pretty sure all of you see lizards doing that, that actually has to do with what Ryan just said. It's their process of surviving, basically. All right, so I think this is going to be our last question. And it is, if the stomach is filled with acid, how come it doesn't eat or erode itself? That is a wonderful question. I'm so glad you asked. So that's a great question, right? Because we're like, oh wait, but acid like destroys stuff, right? How, how does like it not like reach the rest of the body? So first of all, we, we haven't really talked about this yet, but with the cells, we were talking about how like muscle cells are connected, right? Some muscle cells are actually like connected very, very tightly. You can think about it like a plastic bag, right? Plastic bag will like never leak water until there's a hole because it's connected very, very tightly. Just like the cells inside of our actual uh, stomachs, those muscle cells are gonna be connected really, really tight, like even tighter than our arm muscles. And they're gonna be like that because there's the connections between each cell 
is going to make it so none of the acid can escape. And then there's also going to be more like specific layers on top to prevent the actual cells from like the, the muscle cells themselves from being like eroded, which means being like broken down by the acid. All right. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, I hope that I didn't miss any questions. If I did, make sure to just send it to me again so I can see them. But for now, I think that's it. And uh, I think we'll just wrap it up right now because it is pretty late. So I just want to thank Ryan, first of all, for doing this awesome seminar. It was really clever how you just uh, made it really simple for us to understand, even though it's filled with difficult chemical equations, you still managed to present it in a way that it was understandable for everyone, I hope. And again, just big thank you to everyone who came here today because it's really all your support that makes iExplore possible. And we wish to see you again in our next few seminars. We, Ryan will be doing more of these in the future. So make sure to stay tuned for those. It will be on very interesting subjects regarding biology. So again, big thank you to everyone. And I hope that everyone will have a wonderful day. Thank Bye, guys. you guys. Thank you.